Tub Talks with Damon on location in Montreal with the one, the only blogger, author, activist, educator, amazing, amazing person, Mark S. King. Hello. Welcome to the Tub. I, I can only imagine your excitement to have me here. You can't. I am so excited. It must be a here. major get for you. Damon. You are. <laughs> no, seriously. When I started thinking about this show mm -hmm. and planning this out in my mind over yes. a year ago, you were at the very top of the list of people. I'm like, I want to talk to in my bathtub or a bathtub. Doesn't matter if it's my bathtub. Okay. Or not. All right. So I'm so glad you're here. I'm Thank glad. you for taking time. We are very in welcome. Montreal at a very major conference. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on, but Mark's taking the time to share some life, some love, some insights, and everything, whatever we talk about. Whatever comes up. Okay. Whatever right. comes up. I'm willing. I'm okay. willing. Okay. Before we do, I want to hear, Mark, what do you like most about your body? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'm a redhead, and so we're damaged. Um, but we, we grow up feeling with, with we've been called names, you know, freckle like, face strawberry and carrot top and it, it, whatever. Anyway, I was made fun of. I was also um, queer. But, this, but beyond that, I was a redhead. And so I had a lot of shame about my hair. And it, it, it's funny. It's only until I was like in my late 20s that I realized, oh, it's beautiful. Redheads are beautiful. This is actually really nice. Um, and it was almost too late. The damage had been done. <laughs> And so now, thank God that gays have, um, have uh, uh, branded ginger daddies uh, as hot. You know, thank you. Where were they 50 years ago? But, you know, so, so now I color my, this is color. Oh, wow. You know, okay. to, um, to bring back what it once was. Uh -huh. This is all smoke and mirrors. Uh -huh. All smoke and mirrors. You know, it really is. I've had a lot of work done. Like what? I've had um, uh, facial fillers, uh -huh. um, uh, initially to correct the facial wasting, mm -hmm. maybe the drug addiction too, mm -hmm. and uh, then I've had some Botox. Uh, I just had a little Botox for fun okay. on, my, on my thing. So, but the facial fillers, we're talking like a lot over the course of years to build it up to where, uh, to where it should be. I, it's not, I don't want to be a real housewife, but I did want to look like I would have looked had it not been for the facial wasting. And the facial wasting that came from living with HIV. Yes, early medications. Early medications. Okay. okay. And lots of crystal meth. Lots of crystal meth. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> I am so fascinated by your life and so many of the stories that you share. So let's just mm -hmm. go back a little bit um, mm -hmm. to living in LA at the precipice of the AIDS crisis. Yeah. Yeah. You originally moved to L.A. in the early 80s because mm -hmm. you were going to be uh, a movie an star. Actor, a movie star. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and you were with a few movie stars. Uh, true. And yes. people can get your book uh, <laughs> in order to, to <laughs> hear more details about that. Right, right. But you have to be over a certain age to understand the movie stars I was sleeping with because otherwise they, people don't know. Rock you know who they are. Right, yeah, right. right. Nobody knows who the hell he is anymore, and it takes all the fun out of the star fuck story. Oh, I know. When they don't know who the star is. Oh. But anyway, oh, yeah, yes. Okay. So that's why I, okay. I, I moved to Los Angeles, and it was um, 1980. And so I was there for the dawn of... And I was 19 when I moved there. So I, you know, I, I, I was there for the dawn of the epidemic. I was uh, infected during the dawn of the epidemic. Um, uh, tested when I was uh, 24, uh, 1985, as soon as the test came out. So, you know, I was in, in, the, in an epicenter of the epidemic, like a lot of people were, you know. Um, most of the stories you hear are New York-based stories, you know. Um, mine was very much an L.A. story. What was the difference of all of this playing out in L.A. versus New York? Well, the personal difference for me was the fact that I was involved in an agency that was caring for people dying of AIDS, mm -hmm. the Shanti Foundation. And we were trained how we were trained volunteers how to be with people who were dying mm -hmm. and not judge them and not try to fix them and not try to say it's going to be OK when it won't mm -hmm. just be with them, a compassionate presence with them. And um, as opposed to, I wasn't in my Doc Martin, Martins, I wasn't marching in the streets. I was, and I always felt somehow um, uh, as if I was missing something as an activist because I wasn't, I didn't fit that mold. I wasn't doing that thing. Mm -hmm. I was doing a caregiver. I was involved in an agency that was doing a caregiver thing, but I was doing that very much myself through our volunteer work and all of that. So Wow. So you were 
there you were living with HIV at a time mm -hmm. when that was essentially being considered a death sentence. For sure. And for many people you knew, it was a death sentence. Yes, yes. You know, and uh, I, gosh, I, I don't know how to describe it anymore. Um, other than to say it was a graveyard and it felt that way and it was a nightmare and we didn't think we'd wake up from it and or you hoped that you would and you didn't and, and, and all of these things are so terrible and, and it's funny, I, I, I want to tell that story. I, don't, I, I, I want to tell that story in ways that people can hear it, they can receive it, that I'm not bashing them over the head with it. In my day, I had to walk three miles for my AZT. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. I, 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 I want to tell it in a way that maybe is engaging or, or, or to anyone who's receptive to it. Um, but yes, since you asked, that is how, certainly how it was. My closest friends died. People died in my guest room. You know, um, uh, you said goodbye a lot. Uh, you were 24, 25, 26. <sighs> and I think the takeaway, I, there's many, of course, you know, how, how enormously compassionate we were as a community in the middle of all that to be building and loving and ministering and feeding and housing. All of the things that we did in the middle of this nightmare are pretty fucking amazing. Um, and then the other thing is, the, the, in terms of the immediate trauma of it was, you think you'd have your whole life to figure out life's big questions. You know, mm -hmm. why are we here? <laughs> What does it all mean? Is there a God? All of those things. You think you have your whole life. And then suddenly you have that much time. Mm -hmm. And and I had to figure it out immediately. And I became, I mean, I was your basic, vapid, 25-year-old, strawberry blonde in West Hollywood. I mean, my God, you know, I didn't think beyond the next, you know, uh, beer bust. And suddenly I had all these big, big questions thrown at me because everyone's dying. And um, you grow up real fast. You find your own humanity really fast. Um, you discover things about life that you never thought you would know, and certainly n not then. And so in many, you know, I'm not gonna say HIV was a gift. Mercedes is a gift. But I, I carry that experience and I am the better for it now. And so I'll just leave it at that. Were there any were there any spiritualities or philosophies or psychologies that helped you get through that time or answered or gave you insight into any of those questions you were asking? No. Um, I tried my best. I had, I, I had crystals laid on me. Mm -hmm. I went to Louise Hayrides. Uh -huh. I did the whole bit, yeah. you know, and, um, and there were no easy answers and there were no answers that spoke to me really. You know, um, I remember when Leslie died, um, one of my good friends and, uh, we were standing around and waiting for him to die and talking to him and singing to him and comforting him and he finally died and i thought oh my god now i'll see uh, a spirit rise oh the, the curtains will rustle something will happen and finally god will reveal himself to me you know which in itself is pretty selfish when you think about it but you know the, the, the answers I've been looking for since I was a little gay kid in church, wondering why God didn't love me. You know, maybe this, this will be a moment for that. And nothing happened. I mean, he died, he left, and it was quiet. It was quiet. Nothing happened. And, um, and someone much uh, wiser than me eventually told me, you know, God is not in the drapes. <laughs> God is not this Hollywood thing. You were there present for a miracle, and the miracle was Leslie was surrounded by the, the people who cared about him, and we were loving him, and we were singing to him and holding him, and, and that was the, the spiritual miracle that you were looking for. It was right there. It's like, you know, the, the, the person who's uh, searching for God is like a fish swimming in the ocean searching for water. You know, just stop. It's here. Whatever this is, yes. it's here. Very much. I very much feel that way as well. And having been there for a couple of people who have died in the uh -huh. room uh -huh. have felt that way. Mm -hmm. I know that that is perhaps what this is about. And I hope when it's my time that I can be as lucky to be surrounded by yeah. that loving energy that yeah. I call godly energy yeah. at that moment and have that be my, my lived experience in the last breath. Yeah, that would be nice. But the fact that you were able to provide that, and sometimes I've been able to provide that, I think mm -hmm. is like 
to me, that feels as close to a God experience as yeah. one can get mm -hmm. in these bodies. I feel like I'm getting a really nice steam mm -hmm. from this warm water. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if my skin looks as nice as it feels. It looks because, great to me. Because I feel like I'm kind of reddish and, it looks great and, to and me. healthy right now. You look okay. fabulous. All right. Fabulous yeah. All right. to me. Okay. Okay. So, throughout the... this is not easy, people, what we're doing. This is not easy, just being yeah. naked in a tub. It's not easy. There are people that always realize that. They think, oh, people just jump in the tub. No, there's, there's well, a process. And my husband knows I'm doing this, and he yes. says to me, you're wearing a bathing suit, right? I'm like, I don't like, think so. I don't think people wear bathing I don't think that's the point. I think the whole point is to be vulnerable and all of that, which sounds really fun, unless, you know, but and, and anyway. So, yeah, yeah. I'm giving you, I'm, right? I'm giving them nipple. I hope that's oh, yeah. showing up in the, in the, oh, yeah, in the thing. So. That's the other body sure. part I like. Oh, wait, do you want, well, do you want it? No, that's sure. okay. We, I think they get the idea. Okay, great. <laughs> so speaking of nipples oh, and yes. wonderful things, you then, throughout the pandemic in Los Angeles, found that gay men were shifting some of their sexual patterns. They mm -hmm. were sometimes going from in-person encounters to phone encounters, that phone lines, sex hotlines became oh, very, very popular. Nice segue, Damon. Yes. <laughs> Well, and the segue I'm going to is that you worked on a sex hotline. Yes, you I were did. doing sex work on yes, a hotline. I did. I did. Well, I guess it was sex work. It was at least audio sex work. Right. Um, well, that's what we had back then. I mean, that, that's that was right. how people would do. We that didn't have a, we didn't have social was, media. We didn't have a virtual world, right. so people would call nine hundred numbers or nine seven six numbers. It was even through. older than that. Gather around, boys and girls. Back before there was Grinder and before there were AOL chat rooms or an internet or 976 calls, there was an 1 800 number you could call and use a credit card and order the man you wanted to talk to, who would then call you back, collect, and uh, talk to you. And uh, I started working for a company like that because I was a struggling actor and I thought that uh, they probably used actors and I was right. And so I would go from one call to another, like this. I was a David. I'm a David. And so I was dead, and I had a little bit of a southern little. And uh, I was uh, exactly what you wanted, whatever that is. Mm. And so if you wanted them tall and dark and hairy and hung, you know, that was it. Well, they always wanted them up. But if you wanted them smooth and blonde, if you wanted a valley boy, if you wanted whatever. Could you do like surfer boy? Oh, boy? yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. so I'd do a surfer boy one call, I'd do an s and master the next. You know, it was variety people, it's important. Um, so... And this is all over the phone. So it's you're all over, all over, all over the voice. phone. Oh, yeah. I'm not. It's just my voice. You're painting pictures. They lasted about 13 minutes. That includes introducing yourself, getting into the scene they want to get into, manipulating them towards an orgasm, making it sound like you're having one, too. And then if they don't hang up right away, you give them a little preview of coming attractions. Well, you know that uh, trainer I work with, you know, we're going to go to the beach next week. I think I'm going to lay him. Give me a call. I'll tell you all about it. Ooh. That sort of thing. Wow. You know, a uh, you little preview of coming attractions. They were all San Francisco Joe, San Francisco Joes, sucking, fucking, jacking off. We called them San Francisco. Oh, it's a San Francisco Joe. Just, that's all you got to talk about. Nothing weird. <laughs> Nothing out of the ordinary. Um, you know, it, it's easy to make fun of, and, and I write about this a lot in my book, but it's easy to make fun of uh, that time, and it is a lot of fun, and it's funny. It's also true that I started doing it before AIDS happened, and... I learned so much about what game, how what, what makes gay men tick sexually, because these guys were throwing down forty two dollars and fifty cents a call, and and when you pay that kind of money and you're alone in your room with nothing but you and your wet hand, you blurt things out. Mm -hmm. You blurt out things that you really want, right? And I learned a lot about what they really wanted. What did they really want? You know. Well, well, you know, all sorts of sexual things and, and, and all of that. But, but I will tell you this, the, 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 the philosophical answer is what they wanted was to be taken care of. Mm. It's what everybody wants. They wanted to be taken care of. They, and if that meant in that context, someone who was bigger and more muscular and bigger dick or a top, if that's how it manifested itself, fine. But I knew what was driving that. And that's what I was really about. I was that big man who was going to take it all, take it all away, make you feel good, you know, and, and you just surrender to so it. So sexually taken care of. Sexually taken care of and emotionally and taken emotionally care of. Because it's all together, right? Yeah. You know, 
And uh, just just the feeling that you have this man here that's going to be in charge and, 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 and take care. And, and I mean, and, and again, it presented itself in different ways. Sometimes I was more aggressive than other times. Sometimes it was more romantic. There were guys that I talked to a couple times a week for years. And, and one of the reasons I stopped doing it, other than AIDS really overtaking my life and me selling that company and going to work for an AIDS agency. But the other reason was because I couldn't stand lying so much. In other words, yes, it was a persona I was putting on. Yes, it was a job. This is all, we're making a contract between us that you're paying money and I'm going to be this thing. But I had to convince you I really am that thing. And to do so, everything I told you is a lie. Virtually everything about me, about how I have sex, about the fact that I'm a volunteer fireman or a retired minor league baseball player, whatever it is, it's all a lie. And everything I got from them was the truth. They were telling me the truth because they needed to say the truth so that they could get off, so that they could have that connection, so that they could spill their guts about the guy that dumped them or the homophobia they're feeling in their small town in Ohio. Some guys are crying on the phone later because we're developing this rapport, but I never let go of that central identity because then they may, they may not call back. They'll find out it was a lie or they'll find out that this guy's. And so I was just this big lie. And, and yes, I was providing a service and all of that, but I was getting so much intimacy back from them and it just, it fucked with my head. Wow. It fucked with my head after a while. Wow. Yeah. How did meth come into your life? <laughs> you sound like, um, you know, how'd your husband, how'd you meet your husband? Um, well, let's see. Um, I did, I did all the drugs. I did, I have followed the, I have followed the, um, the trajectory of gay men and drugs all my life. The whole alphabet. Oh my God, yes. I mean, I drank in the 70s, I did coke in the 80s, I did the dance floor uh, uh, drugs in the 90s, and then in the aughts, meth happened. And then all the other drugs went away. And it was about that for me. And, um, and, and it was an experimental thing, and I think that I experimented much like I did the other drugs. But like with the other drugs, I went, oh, gosh, I'm doing a lot of that. I should stop. And I did. Mm -hmm. I was not able to do that with meth. And it got bad and it ruined relationships. And I um, went to rehab and I relapsed many times. And I'm very, um, I'm very, um, uh, I, I, I'm very serious about it. I don't even write about it that much because um, staying clean is so precious to me. And uh, a little scary because I still live with those triggers and I live with those memories and the, uh, I live with the um, um, romanticization and sexualization of the drugs and the memories of the drugs because it's so caught up with sex in gay men and it certainly was for me. So I am very uh, humble about that process and about my ability or not to stay away from it. And so I kind of keep it close. I keep my recovery close. How long have you stayed away from it? Um, it's been 10 years, wow. you know, um, and it was a, the previous 10 years was filled with trying, you know? So um, yeah, it's been, it's been back and forth. And, um, uh, you know, I think we get real caught up with time measurements in recovery. Mm -hmm. And I hate to do that only because I don't want to discourage anybody that's trying and it's been a month, mm -hmm. which is great, yeah. you know, um, or uh, should I, God forbid, relapse. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I'm back to square one. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I've had a lot of years of good education and wisdom. Uh, and, I, and, and I know that it's possible to stay clean. Um, so in recovery, we get caught up very much in the time. How much time do you have? My therapist was very much more interested in what's your process of getting sober and seeing it for what it is. And, oh, your relapses are getting further and further apart. Yes. You know, and so he saw, he saw progress there. And anyway, so, yeah. Why, do you, what was the lure of meth? Why was this one so hard to kick when you were able to do the others? Oh, uh, because it was definitely wrapped up in sex. Um, it made you feel naughty. It made you feel bad. Bad is in you know like good bad or bad good bad good, good bad. bad naughty good bad. not naughty good bad. bad you know 
Uh, you know, you know, I've done a lot of work with Dr. David Fawcett, who wrote a mm -hmm. book called Lust, Men, and Men. Beautiful book. Uh, and we've worked together a lot on doing these presentations, you know, and he's he's got a great, he should be naked with you in a tub sometime. First of all, he's 6'9", so good luck with that. But he, uh, he has a great understanding of how it affects our minds, yeah. how it makes us push the envelope in our um, escapist behaviors. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I... I it's hard for me to talk about the recovery because I did and said and watched, participated, uh, talked about a lot of things that are not my authentic self. And I like to concentrate on the authentic Mark and who he is. And, and to think about the other Mark makes me sad. It upsets me a little bit. Okay. Thank you for telling me that. And thank you for, for going, for willing to, being willing to speak that much about it. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Sure. And I think the gift is that when you do, and as you do, there's people watching this that are also thinking about these things, asking these questions, and you're so generous with mm -hmm. your life and your insights and your wisdom. One of the means by which you have expressed yourself so consistently is through your writing. Yeah. And you are such an incredible writer. You just have this way of conveying... Mm -hmm. Using words to convey information, but also a very specific tone and mm -hmm. emotion. Uh, uh. How did that develop for you? I, I don't know. I mean, I come from a kind of a literary family. My mother was a librarian. My oldest brother, who has passed away, uh, wrote uh, eight or ten novels. Wow. He was a novelist. Uh, he did very well. And, uh, and he was the writer of the family, not me. You know, I was just, you know, I'm not me. And, and it just happened slowly. And really, I see... Uh, I appreciate you saying that because when asked, what do you do? I will now say, I'm a writer. Uh -huh. I wouldn't say that for the longest time. It's felt, felt just so, you know, oh, please, you know, you're a writer, really? You know, well, but I am. It's what I do, mm -hmm. you know? And um, uh, and and yes, I, I appreciate the idea that I can um, um, paint a picture of, of things, you know? Uh, uh, the kind of writing I do about HIV isn't so much about the science or the clinical aspects, all of that. and people know that if, if they know me at all about my stuff. It is about the sights and sounds and the way it feels to be soaking in a bathtub with Damon <laughs> and what I'm seeing right now and how it feels, yeah. you know, um, uh, and the experience of living with HIV. You know, I, um, <laughs> I was telling somebody this today. I said, you don't think I have an ego? My whole brand is called My Fabulous Disease. It's all about me, folks. You know, I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, thank God people see that as tongue-in-cheek, you know. But let's face it, it is about my perspective on things, you know. And so, really, you say you've been generous. I feel my audience has been generous in letting me get away with being kind of Filled with myself and and um, uh, seeing the world through my experience, you know. And now that being said, I, I spent a lot of years doing that because it was fun to talk about myself. But I, I have made a conscious choice in, in the last five or ten years to to. Um, am I getting like soap bubbles all over my face? No, no. To um, it's okay if I did. Um, to to move that spotlight onto other people. To write about people that inspire me. To write about the things mm -hmm. that. I, you know, I'll still be opinionated or I'll still write about my own experiences, but it's really nice to take this platform that I've been given, that, that built over the years, to, to shine it on other people, you know, to talk about them. You know, that's nice. That's nice. But would you say, would it be fair to say that by being so open, by being so specific about your experience, the more specific you are, the more people feel that they might be able to get through what they're going through? their mm -hmm. fabulous disease, their mm -hmm. recovery process, mm -hmm. their aging process with yeah. HIV. Oh, the aging. more you talk about that stuff, the more other people feel hope. Is that No, fair? I think it is true. It's funny because years ago, Bonnie Goldman, the late great founding editor of thebody.com, mm -hmm. said to me, I had, con I had contributed a couple of essays to them about, you know, whatever, my, my experience. And she says, why don't you write a blog for us? And I said, what's a blog? Uh -huh. And she says, really, basically, it's just kind of your, your, your ongoing experiences, you know? And, and she said, I will tell you this, the more you reveal, the more people will buy in. Mm -hmm. Reveal, reveal, reveal. Yes. I remember specifically her saying that was the best advice I ever got. Yeah. As soon as we start checking ourselves 
about, well, how will this sound if I say this true thing about myself or about what I saw or what I said? How, you know, as soon as you start checking yourself, you're in trouble. I try very hard not to act as if I know. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes I do, but because um, I do know. But otherwise, I just try to tell the truth about what I saw, what I heard, how I felt, and and have it be true. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, I think that the more you reveal, the more people, uh, the more trust you build. Mm -hmm. You know, and that includes sometimes in my blog taking back things I said. Mm -hmm. That I, I had a change of heart, yeah. Or I regretted being so r harsh on somebody or something, and I have said, "Oh gosh, I'm really sorry, readers." Yeah. That was I crossed the line there. That was bad. You know, I don't know why people don't apologize more. So that's something you've. Always, I don't know why they don't that's, apologize. That's a more. humility, a humanity you share that mm -hmm. I think is much needed in today's social media world. Mm -hmm. Is like you said, that ability to say, "Oh, maybe I didn't get that right," or upon mm -hmm. reflection. I would yeah. say this differently. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry yeah. for what I said. Right. Yeah. And that that feels like what when you are accountable that way. Well, for, it feels like integrity. Yeah. For one thing, um, and and I'll tell you this. <laughs> this is going to sound like I'm manipulating the situation. I'm not. I would apologize most sincerely, and then every time I have, I get all these people going, "Oh, Mark, you're so amazing. Oh, oh, you apologize. Oh, I think so much more of you now." And I'm like. Well, I wasn't counting on that, but I'll take it, you know, yeah. like good, you know, but it wasn't why I did it. You know, I, I would rather not have to apologize because it means I did something wrong yeah. that needs one, you know, so, so I try to avoid it, you know, and, and act right the first time, but yeah. But there um, is an appreciation for that sincerity, for that humility, that humble, the ability to be humble. Yeah. And make amends. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I think true. more people do honor that, respect that, but I, you know, conversely, I think it's becoming increasingly rare in our times. So. Maybe so, because people are entrenched, and you lose so much in translation on a social media post, yeah. a, in a comment string, so much is lost yes. in translation. People double down, they, they resist. They do, they do, and I really try to maintain a generosity of spirit about it. It's, it's rare anymore that I will go in there and participate in that. Mm -hmm. Only because I've learned, like, if I if I post something that's very opinionated, mm -hmm. and I know people are not going to agree, and that's fine, and they start attacking me in the comments, I learned, let let go, let God, just back up, because you know what's going to happen? The other commenters, they'll take care of things. Yeah. They'll take care of it. Yeah. They'll, and they'll start going after each other, and you can go, oh, well, I dropped a bomb and ran out of the room. <laughs> you know, that's okay. That happens. You know? I've seen that a lot. Drop the bomb and run well. out of the room. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. don't stay in the room for all of that shrapnel. Right. Just get out. Right. So it's hey, I like that. I like that was nice. That yeah. was nice. Drop the shrapnel and get out. Yes. yes. Okay. Drop the bomb. Okay. Avoid the shrapnel. Avoid the shrapnel. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying yeah. to like finagle and not touch the background. Don't like, touch the don't background. It is ball. barely hanging on this picture. Barely hanging on. He's so dedicated like to his production design like <laughs> that he had to put a thing on a ledge that's this <laughs> wide. Okay. So, there. so, speaking of getting heat for stuff, yes, you were one of the very earliest public figures to endorse prep 10 uh -huh. years ago, mm -hmm. to start to use your website, your videos, to help people mm -hmm. learn and understand oh. the new science at the time yes. that was emerging about the use of Travada to prevent HIV. Yeah. And I know you were getting a fair amount of flag for that mm -hmm. at the time. Well, and it was one of those things where it's like, just give them time, just just bite your lip, give them time, they'll come around. They're gonna, because they have to, it's science. Yeah. They're gonna come around. Yeah. And, 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 and it seemed so, you know, I don't wanna, you know, like, what were they thinking? But my thought was, I, you know, okay, this is gonna sound very maudlin. I sat in a lot of pews at a lot of funerals going, God, if only there were a pill. If only there were a fucking pill to cure it, to keep us from getting it. Just a pill. Somebody. And we get it, and people are going to question it, and then people are going to get all riled up with sexual politics about who's taking it and who's... I mean, we know what happened. We saw how that all played out, right? And it's playing out with monkeypox. It'll play out. It'll always play out. And, and I've just come to the conclusion that, you know, uh, judging other people is such a lazy way to feel better about ourselves, mm. isn't it? You judge the other, you identify the other, you and, and, and you say it's them, it's them. 
And then I feel better about myself. And, and therefore, it's a very popular human activity. Yeah. You know, everybody does it. Gay men are really good at it. Well, gay it's, a, it's really sort of a it. false high. It's like a shot yeah. of whiskey. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's a drunk thing. It's a hormone thing. It's a drug thing. It's not right. a real authentic right. sense of who you are. Yes, and I see it at every level of the gay HIV hierarchy. I see it from people who are negative about people who are positive. I see it from people who are positive about people who are either un not undetectable or are still having sex, more sex than they're having, you know, right. um, uh, or the list goes on and on. And, you know, um, right. all of us judging people dancing on Fire Island during COVID, you know, like there weren't Trump rallies and NASCAR things and huge concerts going on. But no, let's look at the gay guys, including other gay guys. Right. You know, um, you know, I, I just feel like we got to have more generosity of spirit in terms of what sexuality means, what our own desires mean, where they're coming from, what's driving them. And what's driving them is a lot of trauma and a lot of need for connection and finding the tribe and holding on to it yes. because of the, the first 20 years of our lives and everything that happened then. You know, you know so, you know, uh, uh you know, yeah, we're, there's a there's a lot of, and, and it's always been that way. I mean, in early prep, we made the, uh, the, 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 drew the straight line again and again to the pill for women in the early 60s and how women were labeled sluts if they were going to take it. And, oh, you want the pill? Why? How many men are you having sex with? You know what I mean? Same thing with prep. Uh, same thing with, you know, it's, it's interesting. We haven't seen it yet in terms of like people getting vaccinated for monkeypox. But you know what? There's another thing down the road, and it'll give us the perfect opportunity to go, oh my God, you're a cum guzzling whore, you know? So. Which, of course, for me would be quite a compliment. Yeah, good for you. Well, that would be also known as a compliment. Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> well, like Wednesday, because Tuesdays I seem like. Okay, well, Wednesdays are $10 water night, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it is that thing. It is that propensity to yuck other people's yums, to yeah. shame other people's joy. And there, yeah. that does seem, for me also, to feel accentuated and exaggerated in the gay community. Yeah. The, the anti-sex stance that was prevalent during PrEP, and then yeah. that against U equals U when that science became more valid. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, thank you for the reminder. Yeah. Exactly, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that skepticism. It was that, no, you can't really fuck without risk of HIV. We have mm -hmm. to be afraid, very afraid. And then the, you wrote a wonderful article during COVID about the same exact psychology that was being used to persecute and shame people that were connecting during COVID. Yes, right. Do you... Right. What would it, it, what would you suggest people do instead of shaming other people? Um, um, what mind their own business? I don't know. Um, you know, uh, check themselves. I mean, really, meaning what? Really, uh, but, but, but check check yourself. Where is this coming from? Why do I feel the need to do it? Who am I in that? In who am I in that formula over there? Am I even in that formula over there? No. Okay. Well, maybe I should just sit over here and sit my sit my tea and mind my own business. Yes. Maybe. You know, check yourself. Why is this so important to you? What does it bring up for you? Yeah. Listen to me. I'm telling you, the therapist. No, I'm asking you. But you know, really, you know, right? Your point of view. Yeah. The, yeah. You got to check yourself. Yeah. Why is it? Why is that so important to you? Yeah. Tell me more why about are that. Other people's actions so yeah. upsetting. And I was, I was yeah. going to say, push a button. I say, I don't like to use the word triggering per se. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I say they push a button in you. Yes. Let's look at because. If someone triggers you, fine. You could get rid of them. You could cancel them. You could do whatever. Uh -huh. But your buttons are still your buttons, whether oh, you yeah. do that or not. Oh, okay. So yes. we mm -hmm. we want to be more therapeutic and spiritual about it. We look at the buttons. Yeah. To say, yeah. okay, what in you is in pain? Yeah. yeah. And where like does that. that pain come from? And do you have to respond to that pain with shame and anger? Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Now a lot of people won't ask those questions, but those are the questions I ask when people are willing to have those mm -hmm. conversations. And I think you really also shown with your writing that there is a way to ask those questions to explore mm -hmm. those issues as opposed to just using keyboard criticisms to scapegoat everybody you don't like on the internet <laughs> um why are you always on this side of the tub during these interviews is because you have a good side or is it like letterman's always sitting so there? you know it's okay from the other side we actually really? just got in the tub and i was like oh wait i didn't even ask you i usually ask people if they have a preference really well do you really because you're always on that side no some interviews i'm on the other side because some people okay. do have a preference all right this is just kind of a habit now. Okay. Um, but I guess I also was just thinking, like, I wanted to, like, show off my, um, 
So speaking what? of monkeypox, I was able to get a monkeypox vaccine here in Canada. Oh, I thought you were going to show us your pox. Oh, no. And I was like, I'm not on the top. Thanks. Yeah, Fine. No. Okay. No, thanks to the wonderful system in Canada and the beautiful people in Montreal healthcare, I, yeah. I was able to get. They're like, literally the getting States. it out on the street. They're literally getting it out on the street. Yeah. Um, the only reason I went inside yesterday because it was raining. But before it was raining, they were getting it out on the streets. Yeah. And then when yeah. it was raining, they went inside. That's so great. I got to go That's inside. Great. You have a lot of feelings about monkeypox. Now, I want to say, by the time people watch this, the situation might be different. This yes, is an ever-changing hot gonna, topic. The, the, the line will not fill up in the first 30 minutes, probably. Right. But, you know, but oh, where God, we're God. at today as we're recording this is a, in the United States. It's extremely difficult to access a vaccine dose right now. And um, in New York City, it's nearly impossible. So you have yeah. written about this. You, yeah. so you have some comments to say about this. Oh, well, I, you know, first of all, we need to acknowledge that for now, in our country, it is a gay thing. It's a gay thing. It just is. I don't mean that it's a gay disease. Uh -huh. I mean that it has found its, its home in our social networks, mm -hmm. our social and sexual networks. That's where it is right now. Now will 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 it jump will it jump the rails? Yeah, of course it will probably to some degree. We don't know. Um, it is primarily a sexually transmitted, primarily, um, but much like herpes, it doesn't take intercourse to do it. I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot we don't know, and, and but we do know right now that our fellow gay men need to watch out for themselves and do everything they can. And to me, what that means is. Be more circumspect about your sexuality right now. Meaning what? That means, do I need to go to the sex club tonight? Can I wait three weeks until I get my vaccine? Mm -hmm. You know, now I have had people yell in my face about that. Because, wow. be, well, because it threatens sexuality and it threatens our, our you know, um, you know, our, our sexual outlaw status of some sort. You know, it's, it's like, okay, I get it. We all like to have a lot of sex and we're very sex positive and good for you and all of that. Can you wait three weeks? Can you? I mean, like, seriously, can you? Can you limit it to your fuck buddies that, you know, can you go back into a pot for a few weeks? This is not a lifestyle. This is not a judgment about who we are. Go back to being that, you know, fun-loving slut in six weeks after the, the shots take an effect. Okay? And then get on with your life. Um, I think that that is a reasonable request. Will people honor it? No is the fact that at least I'm trying to talk about it and maybe get people to consider it for a short period of time. You know, I think that that's reasonable. Will it have, I don't know, I'm not gonna say anything I say is gonna make people change their sexual behavior. We learned a lot of, a long time ago how hard that is, right? You know, but it gives people pause. It gives people a chance to think about it. About, um, and I don't care about why you're doing it, why you have feel the need to do it, or, or what is it about yourself that you're expressing? Go for it. You know, um, this is about a short term. This isn't got an end point. You know, this has an end point, this particular, you know, threat. Uh, and that end point for us will come a lot faster if we get vaccinated and we limit new infections. Okay. Can I talk about getting old? Yes. Well, okay. So, so wait, we'll talk about, I do want to hear that, but <laughs> it just sounds interesting because earlier you were saying, when you were talking about prepping you equals you, you were getting a lot of shit from people that were not highly sexual or people who had a lot of discomfort around open sexuality. Now it seems like when you're talking about monkey posture, you're getting shit from people who are highly sexual and... Because the request, the task is different. Mm -hmm. This is a different task. I'm not, this is not a comment on your sexuality going forward for the rest of your life. Why it is you choose to take prep and what that says about your sexuality for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. No, this is about... There's vaccines. They're on the truck. They're on the way. They'll be here in three weeks. Can you please hang on? Just hang on so that we don't have 10,000 more infections before it gets here. Yes. That's, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I understand what you're saying. I totally understand. Okay. Where I think people might be reacting is that the tone feels a little aggressive. Well, the tone feels confrontational okay. when you say that. And I'm not, I know yeah. you're hard. I know you're not being confrontational, but I think sometimes asking, making statements in the forms of questions, like, 
But can, can you, you? Can you? I think where. Well, I didn't want to say. Of, I want. I didn't want to say you should. Well, I didn't I, want to should them. I think I, a know. lot of our strength comes from, and you're you're very highly regarded in this community, as is Dimitri Daskalakis. Mm -hmm. And I think a has lot he been of, in your job? Not yet, okay. Dimitri. All right, I saw him today. Okay. Um, yeah. I think a lot of our strength and power comes from saying, I, this is how I see it. As you said earlier, this is how I'm seeing the situation. This mm -hmm. is what I am doing. This is yeah. what I would recommend. This mm -hmm. is what I really hope our community can get to. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe that's futile. Maybe people are going to do whatever they want to do anyway. Yeah. But I think people are generally more receptive when the person has a buy-in credibility to them, as you do. Far more than that dude at the World Health Organization yeah. who's telling people not to have sex right. or limit right. their partners. Right. Right. He has, like, in my brain, no credibility. Yeah. Right. But you do, mm -hmm. and Dimitri certainly does. Mm -hmm. People who I know, people who I respect, people mm -hmm. who are in living in this community, who love in this community, when you speak mm -hmm. to this, I am so much more. Well, and I'm, a, I'm not the first sex positive person of note to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Peter Staley posted on Facebook right, going, so, hey, people, you know, I know there's no bigger slut than me, but I'm going to hang back. And I think that I was a good example of an I statement. And he said, I'm going to hang back. Right. Okay, in other he words. He was using I statements. Okay, so you need to proofread my, po my, my post maybe <laughs> in the future when I get a little too bossy about what I say. So, again, I'm just, I'm thinking like maybe that's why some of the response you're getting is, is hostile. Because yeah. yeah. it's a little, it's a strong term. I know. And it's funny because, you know, some things that I write are extremely direct. Your mother liked it bareback. You know, some things are very direct and very in your face. And I kind of read it and go, oh my God, I can't believe I said all these things. In, in other words, I'm a nicer person. I want to say I'm a nice person. More so than it comes off on the page sometimes because I'm very direct sometimes. You know, um, and in that case, maybe I was too direct or at least it wasn't a strategic. I wasn't writing as strategically as I might have to get the desired response. Yeah. Um, uh, I just had to say it. And sometimes you bang out these things in 20 minutes and you press publish. And um, uh, now I don't regret that one. Um, I can hear the nuance of, that, you're, you know, that you're talking about. Um, but uh, I, I, it, it's funny. And then there's things that you research and you write and you wait for weeks to put together. And, you know, traffic's like, eh, okay, that's okay, Mark. Yeah. We liked yeah. it better when you were screaming about barebacking, you know? So, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, let's now get into aging and talk about an issue that is... So, if you want to... So, first of all... Before, what? Do you want to... Do you want to... Oh, can, like I, can I use vape? my vape? Please do. Yeah. Can I use my vape? I yeah. hope I don't drop it in the Okay. Phone. So, let's, let's talk about vaping and also in terms of aging. You had been a cigarette smoker for quite some time. I still smoke. Okay. I still smoke episodically. Does, does, you know, if, when I get off a plane in a different town that I live in, mm -hmm. I buy a pack of cigarettes. Okay. I'm like a travel smoker, you know, um, and so I've been smoking a little bit on this trip. Um, and, uh, you know, so I smoke off and on and I quit sometimes for a period of time. Um, I am in a period now where I am smoking. We just made a move to Atlanta. I guess it was like, let me list for you all of my stresses so that I can, I can tell you why it is I do things that are bad for me. Um, but never, there you are. Well, what does it do for you? Um, it is, uh, it, it, it helps with stress. Mm -hmm. It's a go-to. Nicotine. It's a go-to. Yes. Yes. Or this. This. Smoke it. Well, nicotine is the main drug in. R right. Cigarettes. Right. But the behavioral, the behavioral, oh. you know, it's this. So it's, it's not this. just the drug, it's the ritual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does vaping help or fill in? Um, or you know, I think, it, I think it does because it's the same sort of. It's the same sort of uh, physicality to it, uh -huh. um, and it definitely has uh, some form of... Now, you're, you're, you're going to get people and say, oh, but it's worse than smoking in some ways, and maybe it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, kill the alligator closest to the boat. It's cigarettes for me. If I can vape a little bit, you know, and they find crystallized, who knows what, you know, uh, polyurethane in my lungs after I die. Well, it's unfortunate, you know. Well, what's also unfortunate in the U.S. anyway is that people are ignoring the data around vaping as a harm reduction strategy. It's yeah. not a harm elim elimination. It yeah. is just believed to be 95% less harmful than combustible cigarettes because okay, there's no tar, there's no tobacco. Good, because I threw away a pack of cigarettes when I bought that vape okay. yesterday. <laughs> I did. Okay. You know, so there. Okay. So you have now, I don't know how old you are. I'm going to just ask you since you brought it. You open the window, as they say in court. I'm 61. Beautiful. 
Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you at this point to be 61, living with HIV, having been diagnosed in the 80s? Oh, well, oh, it's all frosting on the cake. That's what yeah. you want to hear, right? It's no, all no, no, it's not what I want to hear. I want to hear you know, what you want I, to say. I, 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 I have this picture of me breathing my last, surrounded by family and friends yeah. who are singing to me and loving me, and me saying, if I could just have a couple more minutes, you know, could, could I have your attention? I just, I just need a couple of minutes, you know? You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, and, and it's because I love it so much. I love all this so much. I love it all so much. I want to know how Better Call Saul ends. I want to see what the next big film is. I want to see theater and art and love and my and my husband. I want it. I want. I. I want. I want. I want. You know. Now, that's either the sign of someone deranged and egotistical, or it's a sign of someone who just loves what's happening. You know, life is beautiful. You know, and so. On my better days, I see it that way, and I see, you know, on my so some of it is about the end, and I I am as wrapped up in my own mortality and my fear of it as anybody. Oh my gosh, it's the first ten minutes of every night trying to go to sleep. Oh yeah, oh I I I see a therapist. Um, that is that is very present, ever, ever present in my life, and I think it's because. Mortality was such a thing so soon, you know, so soon and, and witnessing what I witnessed, you know, um, front row. So there's something to be said for that. And then the rest of it is really just aging things in terms of, you know, I'm, I am, I am, I have bought into gay culture, lock, stock and barrel. Mm -hmm. Give me my 501s, my, my Doc Mark and my black, my black tank top. And my, and my hair fluffed up to, to high heaven. You know, in other words, I am a product of the late 70s, the 80s. And, um, and we are a people <laughs> that, you know, saw great mortality. And st I don't know what I'm trying to... Let's take mortality out. Let's take AIDS out of there, if it's possible. And just say that I, I, I want to stick around. And here I... And yet I smoke, Right. Vague. Vague. Yeah, nevertheless. Yeah. I, I, and yet I do things that aren't in my best interest, you know, health what you know, generally speaking, I, I'm doing my best. Um, it's harm reduction. You know, but, you know, I, it's a whole thing. With, wait, wait, you know, wait, can I say, yeah. we all have, I have, we all have things that could bring us closer to mortality that sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. And again, I think the key here is just to say, okay, can we find a way to reduce potential risk and enjoy the, our pleasure that we enjoy. You're right. And make a difference along the way and all of those things. And it's true. You know, anybody will tell, I mean, all throughout, I always say all art is about the passage of time. Yeah. All art, yeah. all, all, all meaningful, you know, documentation is about the passage of time. It is by definition, right? And, 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 and what it all means, you know, um, to me, I go back and forth between those big questions and just the cosmetic nature of it. I'm getting older. I, I would have looked a lot better in this bathtub 15 years ago. You know, there's that. There is the constant comparing of seeing the youngsters on the street and remembering what that was like and whether or not do I feel jealousy? Do I feel like, ugh, if I could only just, you know, or do I feel like, yeah, but I've earned my station where I am now. And, 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 and on better days, that's how I feel. That's a, I, I, I can see them and I can grin and I can remember and I can hope that they're having a great time, you know, um, and it's probably pointless to tell them everything they're in for, you know, pointless. People say a lot to me, long-term survivors like myself, you'll hear, um, gosh, if they only knew what we went through, you know, then they would, they would do this better. They would do that better. They would take care of them. If only they'd seen what we saw. And I'm like, you know, I don't want them to see what we saw. Yeah. Okay? Don't want them to see that. Yeah. We worked real hard so that they could be maybe a little empathetic about the HIV thing. Maybe a little. Because they got other shit. Yeah. We, every generation has their shit. You know? I, I, when I was in my 20s, I guess, you know, and Vietnam vets were still in their camo and, and at the... Uh, 7-Eleven at every street corner asking for money, you know, vets, that's who they were, you know. I never walked up to anybody, including my own brother who was in Vietnam, 
for as long as he lived. I never said, tell me, tell me all about it. Tell me what happened. I want to know. No, what do I care? I had my own life. And then pretty soon I had my own shit. Yeah. Right? We all got it. So as a 61 year old gay man, uh -huh. I'm hearing that parts of you feel very centered in that. Parts mm -hmm. of you take your stand. Mm -hmm. Can feel some grace and mm -hmm. peace and pride in that. Yes. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then part of you looks around and is like compares or? Sure, sure, because we're in a youth success society. I mean, it's not just gay men. I mean, ask the parents of any 14 year old girl. It is youth obsessed. Younger people want to be older. Older people want to be younger. You know, it's Do you like, want to be younger? Um, I, sometimes, sure. Why? Sure, sometimes, um, because I had a lot of fun and I want more because I'm so, I so, you know, I have a big appetite. I have a big appetite, you know? Um, and, and it, gosh, I, I, I hate to think how this must sound to people, you know, because clearly I am so grateful for how many years I've had HIV for how many? 38, I, you mm -hmm. know, and counting. And so I should just be grateful for that, you know, and I am, yeah. and I am. Um, I love the Woody Allen joke of the two little old ladies sitting in the deli. And one of them says, oh, the food here. It's just awful. And the other lady says, I agree. And such small portions. <laughs> you know, and it's life. It's life. It's, it's sometimes it's bad and sometimes it's just awful. Whatever, it's so short. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. so it's a mixed bag. Now, you said if you had been in this bathtub 15 years ago, you would feel differently. Oh yeah. So you would look at it, so oh, what, you do, know what? what do you think? Having said that, may I also say, because I would have looked great, uh -huh. and I had a trainer, and I had the steroids, and all that crap, and I was also a crystal meth addict, and uh -huh. miserable. Okay, I was going to say. trapped in my own, like, some, you know, butch armor bullshit, you know, so. So, so would yeah. the, the market 15 years ago really been able to engage in this conversation and I would feel not have been that present. kind of sensor. I wouldn't have been present at all. Okay. I would have been seeing how my arms look on this uh, okay. video. You so know, maybe there time. wasn't a better then than now. Yeah, it's an improvement. Or I just wonder what the mark of 15 years from now is going to say about the mark of today. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up and be happy. That's what he and said. Be happy. Are you still that. writing the fucking blog? My God. That's what it'll say. You know, like relax. You're you're retired with your husband. Would you please yeah. get off the laptop? Stop writing. I mean, you know, he would like to see you. He's making brownies. Yeah. You know. So one, I thank you, and I so appreciate that you're so open again about this, mm -hmm. about everything, but about the mm -hmm. the pros and cons of aging. Some parts mm -hmm. of it are great. Some parts of it really suck. Yeah. yeah. I mm -hmm. think one of the reasons it's harder for gay men to age is because up until very recently, we just haven't had a prototype. We haven't had a blueprint. We haven't had a cohort. Well, we skipped a generation. We skipped a generation. Yeah. But I do think that you and some of my other guests, Phil Wilson, Gary Paul Wright, Jim Corey, John Bonelli, all men in their 60s and upward mm -hmm. talking about aging, saying, we don't really have role models for this, but we get to create the blueprint for this. Mm -hmm. We get to to live our lives with, with purpose, with pleasure, yeah. and, and find ways to cope with this, knowing that we don't really have role models. Mm -hmm. And I think you're one of the people that's showing our current generations coming up. It's like, hey, you get to be 61 and still have fun in life mm -hmm. and write amazing things and have strong opinions and sit mm -hmm. in bathtubs and, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're leading the way. You mm -hmm. certainly are for me anyway. Well, I appreciate that. I will see how long I can keep that up. You know, I would like to continue. To, I'd like to be 71 uh -huh. and, and having conversations like this and writing about it. Yeah. You know, and uh, and uh, we'll see. In 20 years, I'll just be a, a what do you call those three-dimensional, you know, people that pop up like, you know, uh, um, help us Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, her. Holograms. I'll be a hologram. I'll be a hologram telling you about what it's like to be have living with HIV for 60 years. Yeah. You know? So... Okay, well, let's plan to come back into the bathtub, whether it's this one or Brooklyn or, yeah. or Atlanta okay. or wherever you are. Let's, let's, let's plan to have a talk about that and what that's like. Okay. Okay? Oh, yeah, sure. We, okay. okay. Um, again, I want to thank you. I want to say hi to Michael, the, your husband, who is so sweet hi, and Michael. so supportive of us doing this. Thank yeah. you, Michael, who's mm -hmm. a very wonderful man, a really great cook. 
So yes, oh, yeah, yes, you know that. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. He made a, a pasta for us once at uh, really? all of us. Remember, there were like yes. twenty of us in your, in your right. living room, mm-hmm. and and we had a conversation about nudity online. And you were like, I don't know if I'm really comfortable with this penis on on social media thing. Oh, and yes. all, everybody turned on their phones and showed you like, oh, the line is right here. Oh yes, I think that's fascinating. I know we're trying to wrap this up, but this is fascinating. In my day, in my day, if you had a picture of yourself, it was a Polaroid and it was stuck under a blanket somewhere, you know, that you, what, what, did, you what did you do with it even, you know, right. um, but, you know, I think there might be video of me, but that was during the drug years, but otherwise, I never had dick pictures or naked pictures, even when I was single and cruising around, I just couldn't bring myself to do it, yeah. and, and it was funny because every friend I knew, oh, just go online, oh, oh, there's their penis, oh, oh, oh there's their ad, there's their, there's their anus, there's something in their anus, you know, like, there it is, for all... It's like, sociologically, how have we changed where that's become an okay thing? Not, not that it's not okay. I'm just old-fashioned. That's all. I don't, I don't judge it at all. I'm a little amazed by it, maybe a little envious of it. But wow. I mean, wow. I think, it's, I think that you know? is an advancement. I think that's a plus of internet and social media. Because nudity, when I was growing up too, was so forbidden as yeah. a therapist. Mm-hmm. If you, you know, had naked pictures swarming around somewhere and people got hold of them, that could be a career ender. Yeah. Everybody has naked pictures now. And mm-hmm. everybody under the age of 30 has naked no. pictures of them somewhere on the internet yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And it's no longer a deal breaker as far as one wanting to be a therapist or a doctor or a politician. It's like, okay, well, it's the human body. Mm-hmm. It's natural. It's beautiful. I think that's a plus. You know, you have like five little hairs on your chest. There are only five of I them, know. and four of them are gray, and it's really kind of adorable. Aww. It's really kind of endearing. Thanks. Right there. Yeah. yeah, I'm follically challenged. No, it's okay. I'm it's jealous. Fine. It's all right. I know. Right. That's been on uh, many of the other Tough Talks, too, is the differences in how people feel about body hair. Really? It's very interesting. You know, I'm blonde, and my no. husband calls me an orangutan, because uh-huh. the hair is red. You can't tell, but the hair is red, and I'm covered in it. Wow. You know, are you jealous of that? I can't really That's tell. You can't look really hard to see. Okay, okay. I, I see the shadows. Hair. Yeah. Shadows? Okay. Yeah. All right, fine. Never mind. The point is that um, blondes can be hairy, too. Okay. And redheads. On that note, yeah. my last question for you. Yeah. Given what you have seen in this world, given what you've seen over the past 61 years, what, if anything, today gives you hope? Um, um, anything. Uh, love. Love. Community. The fact that we always show up for each other, eventually, we always show up for each other in the end. And that gives me hope. In each other's ends or in the end? Yeah, well, you know, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a top. <laughs> and if people want to read your book to learn more about that. Oh, fine. They fine. can get it. Yeah. The, a Place Like This is my is, is the memoir. and It's uh, really good, by the way. Mike is such a good writer. It's such an interesting memoir. Thank it you. has so many unique experiences, unique to the early 1980s in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. but also you being there at the epicenter in Los Angeles mm-hmm. of the AIDS crisis. Yeah. It is so worth reading. And if people want to keep following your work, My Fabulous Disease, the link is right below on YouTube. Where else would you like people to follow you? That's it. That's home base. That's My Fabulous Disease. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, or do you want people to follow you on Twitter? Oh, they can at My Fab Disease. My Fab Disease. But I don't want to confuse them. They can come. You, you, you fix me. They can multitask. They can follow Text you more me. in one place. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what you ask for. <laughs> really? You just got a, a weird text right before we got the text. I'm like a dick pic now. Yeah. Okay. Saying, well, well, see, I have one. You know, yeah. Who knows from okay. where? Okay. Great. Mark, thank you. You're, You're amazing. Thank Love you. you. You're really inspiring. And you. I just encourage people to keep having these conversations in their bathtubs, in their pools, in their brunch tables, wherever they're having conversations. Talk about endurance, life, love, harm reduction, and yeah, we'll get there. That sounds good. All right, baby. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Just. Mwah. <laughs>